Greater Hudson community, I'm sorry. Superintendent Joseph Hockrider, today is Wednesday. It's August 12th. Uh, we're running a little behind. We apologize. We had some technology issues at the district office related to the thunderstorm, uh, but we are with you and we're glad that you are with us. This is the Hendrick Hudson School District Board of Education meeting. I am in our district office with our producer, Greg Cavallari, as well as Anthony Merlini and Enrique Catalan, and other team members in the board are dialed in virtually. And with that, I'll turn it over to our board president, Dr. Abraham. Hi, good evening. Um, um, you already kind of introduced us. We're going to do a roll call so that everybody knows who is present, and this is for our district's quick benefit as well. So, Lisa Anderson? Present. Mary Pat Bricky? Present. Corey Notrica? Here. Bill Arricchio is absent this evening. Alexander Phillips. Here. And Lori Ryan. And of course, myself. All right, can I get a motion to approve the agenda as stated, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, are there any items that anybody would like pulled from the consent agenda? I, this is Lisa Anderson. I would like to pull the, from the general part of the consent, consent agenda, section 3.1, the resolution on the pilot agreement and the first amendment to the pilot agreement. Okay, okay thank you. And anybody else? Alex? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Alex, you're on mute. You're muted. Alex, you're muted still. Uh, uh, I'm going to put the pistol the first. Okay, thank you. Can I get the rest of the consent agenda approved as stated? Can I get a motion? So moved. All in favor? Uh, can I get a second? Second by Lisa. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. So the first item that was pulled from our consent agenda this evening is are the pilot resolutions and first amendment to the pilot agreement. And this was Lisa Anderson that had those items pulled. Did you have questions? Um, I did. Mostly I just wanted to have a, a pull it for discussion um, because this is something that I'm not sure that a lot of our parents are familiar with at this time and to make sure we all understand what this is about. Um, I do have some specific questions, but maybe just in general, if someone could address what this is and what this means for our district. Sure, we can do that. Enrique is with me. Uh, he and I have been part of a team with the town of Cortland, with uh, the village of Buchanan, to try to renegotiate the last number of years uh, with regards to the Indian Point pilot agreement. Uh, we discussed it throughout our budget process that it was imminent. Uh, but the agreement has uh, been approved and tonight is for the board to approve it. So Enrique can speak to uh, the financial matters and um, why this is good news for our community. Thank you. As we mentioned several times, uh, we had an agreement with Entergy that uh, runs through 2025 and in this agreement uh, when they shut down their uh, two nuclear plants the payments go down originally by the first year 30%, the second year 30%, the third year 30% and then they stay at 10% of the original um, uh, the original pilot. Um, we were not happy with that. We pressured, specifically Joe and I, we went to the town and the village and we said we think we can do better for uh, our school district and town and village people and let's try to pressure energy and see if we can get a better deal. And that's what we did. Uh, we went there and we said we don't want 30%, we want less than 30% uh, reduction. And we were able to get a two-year deal 
in which the first year instead of having a 30% reduction we get a 25% reduction and the second year instead of getting another 30% reduction we only get a 25% reduction. That represents about $800,000 more than if we had not been able to get the deal. So in the next two years we're getting $800,000 more in pilot payments than our original uh, agreement with Entergy. So that's the bottom line. Thank you. Um, so after that second year then, we're being reduced down to 50% at that point. What happens after that? We go back to the original agreement. The 30? It'll be 30% then? It will be 30% and then 10%. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then there was a part of the um, a part of the document that talked about negotiating of a successor agreement. And if you could just maybe talk a little bit about how that works, because it, it seems as if to me that, that means that they have the right to still put things back on the tax rolls. And we do too. And we do too. Okay. Yes. So at any point, now that we have this agreement for two years, at any point after that, <clears throat> We can decide to move the move uh, the, in, the Indian Point both nuclear reactors to the to the tax rolls. And doing that will have a lot of problems uh, from both. <coughs> Sorry, a lot of problems specifically for us because as soon as uh, 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 we do that they will do a tax sorry, we will have to spend the money and then put money aside and we'll go through litigations until a judge decides what's, what's the fair value of uh, two nuclear reactors that are shut down. But that can happen. So uh, we have the, the right and they have the right. Okay. And then the other question I had was um with the purchase or the presumed purchase of the nuclear power plants by Holtec, they are responsible for this agreement once oh. that sale through, is that correct? Yes, when uh, uh, my understanding is that they are buying Indian Point as is with all the assets and liabilities and that's obviously one of their liabilities. So yes, they have to at least, uh, you know, the, the transfer of the agreement goes to them. Okay. Thank you very much, Enrique. I appreciate the, the insight and the explanation. Yep. Does anybody else have any questions on this, on these items? Okay, so can I get a motion to approve the pilot agreement with Entergy and the First Amendment to the pilot agreement, please? Lisa, so moved. Lori, second. Lori, second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right, um, so the next item that was pulled was fiscal 3.2. And that was Allie Philbin. Um, hi, I just wanted details on the three separate um, budget transfers. If you could just give us some details on where the money is moving to and from. Sure. Um, well, can you put it there? Because like that, we can talk about the same. On on the regular textbooks, that it's forty-seven thousand dollars. Uh, that's for the, um, what happened was that we, the way we always budget is we budget textbooks by <clears throat> by school. So everyone in the schools, the principals, we get together and they say I need X number of textbooks. But this year, uh, uh, Margaret decided that it was better for the budget for budget purposes 
uh, for her to have control so that she knows exactly what everyone is uh, buying uh, rather than the principal and this year Blue Mountain had to spend a lot of money in I think the math and science so the idea was okay we, we've all always done it by school and also because of um, the new accounting from the government where they want to see that all schools uh, get proportionate money so we had to put it by schools and then transfer it to an account for um, Margaret so she did she buys the books so this is just how Margaret is deciding how to uh, how to buy the books and she's centralizing that purchase order Um, there was two other ones. The other one, um, budget transfer two, was like plant maintenance, and then the, the third one had a big line item of almost like um, $800,000 or something. Yes. The way we budget is that the, the health insurance waiver, which means everyone that th does not take health insurance with us because their spouse has health insurance, so we pay them a you know, depending on the union or the uh, a different amount, but I need to budget that in the health insurance account code because it's due to a health health insurance issue. So in May June, when we pay those waivers, we need to transfer the money from the health insurance to an account code that pays as part of a payroll and that's the $842,000 and the other part is, uh, is for the custodians, the $31,000. So that's what it is. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Our district students. 
Our role is to make policy decisions that protect the overall district vision and that provide clarity in the operations of our district. Our role is to collaborate with our district professionals to formulate a budget that is responsible to our students and our community. Our role is to listen to our community members and, if possible, to advise them on how to have, how to have their personal concerns addressed or to bring wider concerns to the attention of the school administration. The board knows how important it is to have students in a classroom with their peers and with a teacher for both the student's educational well-being and the child's social well-being. The primary focus of the board and the administration is to open schools as soon as it is reasonably safe to do so and to provide a robust digital learning experience until then. Let me stress, although the primary focus is to open schools, the primary concern of the board and the administration is the safety of our students and staff. There is nothing more important to an effective learning community than feeling safe in your learning space. Although initial planning started earlier, over the past five weeks, our teaching professionals have produced groundbreaking collaborative work that has laid a strong foundation for a safe return to school. The district and the board have received emails, survey responses, and phone calls from our parents, which have contributed to this work. We know that parents want more direct collaborative input. Now that a strong foundation, based on Governor Cuomo's directives, and CDC, New York State Department of Health, and the State Education Department guidance has been laid, it is time to start building on that foundation with more direct input and collaboration from a wider pool of stakeholders. This week, parents received information on when and how they can contribute to their school's reopening plan. The first question and answer session was earlier today. There will be a second tomorrow and a third on Monday, but that is not the end. The conversation between school professionals, parents, and other stakeholders is critical and will continue prior to the opening of school and throughout the fall via FAQ questions and answer sessions and PTA meetings. These are uncertain and difficult times brought about by the most severe health threat in modern history. We are fighting an enemy that cannot be seen, heard, smelled, or felt. That can be overwhelming. Families will have varying risk factors and comfort levels to address. Some, like our first responders and essential workers, such as Claire Carey, has been providing meals in all kinds of weather, have been at work outside of their homes throughout the pandemic. Some have been able to work from their homes. Some have not been able to work at all due to childcare issues, health, or loss of employment. Each family's situation and comfort level is different. I am pleased that when our schools are able to open, our district's families will have the choice of their students participating in remote learning or in-building learning based on personal circumstances and not solely on medical necessity. Lastly, we do have steps we can take to fight against this disease. In order to do so effectively, we need to rely on our neighbors to fight along with us. Wear a mask, maintain distance, wash hands frequently, and isolate if you're feeling sick. And please, keep the communications and suggestions coming. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hockrider and his staff for, and his team, I should say, for our, a very important update. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, first start with Anthony Merlini. Uh, he is with us. He is going to give us a, a brief update on various supplies, materials, and equipment that have been ordered, that have been received by the district, uh, that are all new um, in terms of mandates from the various departments of health uh, and the state education department to make sure that we comply with new regulations. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, as Joe had mentioned and then earlier in today's uh, presentation, we discussed um, different um, PPE products and other um, uh, things that we have been purchasing to comply with um, the recommendations of SED and CDC, etc. Um, there's a list, there's a table of things that um, they want to see us have supplies in our, um, in our, in our buildings. Um, they also want to make sure that we have a line of communication with different vendors and we source these vendors um, to find different supplies and different PPE and different things that we're going to need to keep our buildings functioning. So um, in terms of masks, we've, um, based on their little table, we've ordered masks 
uh, about 110,000 they're, they're coming this week um, that we'll be able to use for um, staff and if needed for students. Um, we've ordered supplies for our nurses in terms of gowns, um, uh, N95 masks, and um, different things that they'll be using. Infrared thermometers, non-touch uh, thermometers, uh, we ordered a bunch of those that we can use those to help screen individuals as they come into the building or as needed for the nurse's office. Um, we have face shields. We've got a bunch of different face shields from the several different vendors and some donations, which is very nice. So we see get donations. Um, so we'll be using those different things during the course of um, coming back to school or for cleaning or etc. Um, we've also um, been involved in getting um, different types of equipment that we're going to need to apply these different um, sanitizers and disinfectants. Um, we've ordered those. We have some that have already come in. We're making way with um, additional chemicals and different um, products that we're going to use on surfaces to treat surfaces throughout the buildings to help um, lessen the threat of this, um, this virus. Um, so we're going to keep doing that. Uh, we've been buying um, other different types of equipment that we're going to install in our um, HVAC equipment or ventilation equipment. Uh, we're going around and making adjustments to those things as well. Uh, we're installing hand sanitizing um, stations where we can. We're buying portable ones to have portable ones where we will need them. So all these things are happening and behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot of other equipment that's out there and technology that's out there. Some we can use, some we can't use. Um, because we're a school, we're governed by um, a lot of different regulatory agencies. Um, in the private sector, you're allowed to use different things that we just can't use in our buildings for one reason or the other. But we will vet those as well and see what we can use. And if it's worthwhile, we will get those as well. So there's a lot of things happening in terms of that um, to keep the building safe for our staff and students for when they arrive back into schools. Thank you. Any questions for Anthony? Me, um, me, Ant, I missed. Sure. I missed something. Did we say that we had dividers for desks? At this time, we're not purchasing the dividers for desks. Um, we're not mandated to. Um, we have been installing dividers on office desks and things like that, where we can't social distance, or we will have. Um, I don't want to say public, but maybe vendors or other individuals that are in close proximity um, for like guidance offices and office main offices and things like of that nature. Lori, we have purchased them through PPS, um, yeah. and they will be spread out amongst the district. And then from there, Anthony and I will discuss um, next steps if we need more throughout the district. Right. Um, I I could voice my opinion like I'm not for them, but I guess people would be safer to have them. I know like we're building stuff with those little tubes and just plastic dividers instead of buying such expensive ones. You know, that would be an idea too. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and then also like uh, Lisa was alluding to that with, with the face shield, so you can use the face shield as well for those individuals that are medically un unable to wear a mask. So there are other concessions that we're looking into. But that's what I'm talking about. Kids wearing a mask all day. You know, you're talking right. about young kids. I, I, I kind of like the little dividers better. If there's like 10 desks in the classroom or however many can fit, and you can make a, I can't see me. Hold on. And you can make, it's, it's just like a, a partition like this, and each desk fits in between. Mm -hmm. It would, I just, I made them from iron, so I thought it was a good idea. Yep. Depends on the circumstance. We'll, you know, we'll be working with the principals and, Etc. to see what we what we need and what we can and can't do. Thanks. You got it. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Well, I just have one one quick question. Has that, there been any discussion about the masks that the kids are, are allowed to wear? Um, there was a recent study that showed that some masks are actually worse than no mask at all, uh, and some masks are better than others. Will we be providing masks to students that don't have the right mask in the event they come up with something that is not effective? The, the guidance received 
uh, speaks to the district providing a mask that could be cloth, it could be three ply. Uh, it doesn't specify, you know, specific make or model or quality. Uh, that guidance may change, um, but that's in our in our reopening plan in terms of what the CDC expects of of districts to purchase. We certainly can speak with our vendors and uh, make sure that what we're ordering is. Um, you know, complies, but even the simplest face covering uh, meets the CDC requirement. Yeah, I think Corey's question yeah, is on the other end, if, if somebody on the outside is bringing it in. Isn't the CDC requirement, the state guidance, like a minimum requirement, and we should be exceeding that requirement? Right? Is, is there any mandate that says you cannot exceed their requirements? Not at all. I want to make sure I have your your question okay. right. Your question is yeah, about the. Is, are we going to give the kids the better masks in the event they come in with a mask that's that could be worse than having no mask at all? So the masks we purchased, um, one hundred and ten thousand three ply masks, right. as well as face shields for kids that need them, um, N95 masks for uh, nurses and and those staff. The one hundred and ten thousand masks we ordered are three ply. Okay, and and where do they fall on the scale of you know? They're the, the highest. They are the surgery. They're they're the surgery grade three ply masks. Okay, okay. So I think that was like number two yes. or three on the list, if I right. remember that. Okay. Yeah, ninety five was number one, and this was number two. Okay. All right. That's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's uh, let's go to Laura Nyer. She's been working with um, many different staff, uh, tech coaches, administrators, teachers, getting geared up in terms of hardware, software, and um, focusing on digital learning and platforms. So, Laura, if you'd like to give an update. Sure. Just to um, continue uh, the planning that we've been doing throughout the summer, we have a team of tech coaches that have been working. Um, specifically on preparing um, a few different things. We have tech coaches that are working on preparing websites with tutorials and resources and guides for students, for families, um, and also tweaking the internal website that we've been using as a resource for all staff to ensure that our teachers and our instructional staff have the resources they need with tutorials, whether they're created by the tech coaches themselves or pulled from the internet from valid sources. Um, we've been meeting on pretty much a weekly basis, if not more, um, with Specifically, I have to break down. We meet. I meet with an elementary team of tech coaches and a secondary team of tech coaches, who I rely on to be a liaison for me. From their colleagues, they're providing me feedback from you know the experience that we had in the spring, and also reaching out to people to see what they need and what they're working on. Part of the process has been to kind of whittle down the software and the resources we are using so that teachers and students are not overwhelmed with too many options and that we be, can become an expert in a smaller amount of um, programs and tools. They are preparing um, tutorials on, for example, how to use your Chromebook, um, you know, online etiquette, how to write an email to a teacher. Um, and actually creating Google Classroom models and samples that teachers can use uh, across K through eight so that if you're a parent and you have kids in an elementary school and a middle school, you know what Google Classroom, Classroom is supposed to look like, you know where to find your assignments, it's all standardized and set up. And these Google Classrooms are created as resources, again, for teachers, but also students and families. Um, the secondary group um, has been working with the implementation of Schoology, which is a learning management system. Um, the, it's really fun to watch the tech coaches. They get really excited every time they learn a new trick, a new, new thing about Schoology, and they're so excited to roll it out. There is a aspect of it that allows for parents to have an account, which is much more advanced than what Google Classroom has. Um, it allows for guidance counselors and social workers to be able to kind of be advisors and check in on their students' schedules and their assignments. It allows, for example, if I'm a science teacher, 
I can see that my students in my class also have assignments due you know, on Friday in math and English, and so it helps the teachers communicate with each other and really ensure that they're not, um, you know, all creating a, a test or a paper due on the same exact day. It also allows for um, clubs and co-curricular activities to work together. Um, so it's a really unique um, collaborative platform, and I'm, I'm very excited. It's, it's a lot of work, but um, today actually was a full day of training for the high school tech coaches, the high school administration, um, and we, you know, we, we're learning, and the plan is to turnkey, as we do with everything, we train the trainers. So our tech coaches are our experts. They get to learn the, the platforms and the tips and the tricks, and they also, through the process, learn how to teach the rest of the staff. Um, so that's something that we'll be rolling out. Um, we also have tech coaches working um, just on the uh, privacy, privacy work with Edla 2D. So they've been collaborating with, um, since um, probably February, we've been collecting a list of all the programs that teachers rely on and love to use, and we've been vetting them to make sure that they um, kind of pass muster with Edla 2D and that the vendors sign the contracts that we need them to sign and the Parent Bill of Rights. So they've been going through that list and they are uh, creating processes for going forward sort of what the workflow looks like for vetting future vendors and software that teachers are requesting. Um, We've also been working with our uh, support at BOCES um, with model schools and you know, getting ready and planning for, again, the tools that we need and figuring out the support that needs to come with that. Um, Chromebooks are being rolled out. We're very excited about this. Um, I'm proud to say that Hendrick Hudson might be one of the few districts that is not in a situation where we're waiting for back-ordered Chromebooks that won't arrive till January or February, like many of my colleagues who are struggling to figure out what they're going to do when schools open. So all of our students are getting Chromebooks. If they already had a touchscreen Chromebook, we asked them to keep it. It was just a safer way for us to manage them for various reasons. So um, anybody who did not have a touchscreen Chromebook, they are being assigned by buildings. Um, this is a, can be an inconvenience for a parent who maybe has to go to two or three schools, but we, the way we're trying to inventory our system, we have a new inventory system that um, is a barcode and is scanned really quickly. It was important for us to take the time to roll these out appropriately, so we're doing it building by building. And we're trying to offer two different pickup times, so the family's away on vacation this week and there was a pickup, we'll find an alternative time for them to come get their devices. Starting on Monday, the teachers will all be able to get their Chromebooks, which is really exciting, so they can um, all have devices, brand new devices that they're ready to use, and again, they're also touch screen, they're a little bit of larger monitor. Um, we, last week, the last box came in, and sometimes we get boxes with one Chromebook, and sometimes we get boxes with 12, 40, 160. It's interesting how the companies send them out, but we have them all, which is really, really exciting and really great news. Um, I had met with HHCEF today. We were supposed to meet last week, but we all lost power, so um, we, they are helping us uh, with a grant so that we can supply styluses for every teacher and every student and also helping us provide um, Chromebook cases for may, our free and reduced families that may not be able to afford to purchase a Chromebook case. Um, on the district website under instructional technology, we do have a link to one-to-one -one device. So it has the various resources on there. And we do have an updated form that parents and students are required to fill out and to understand the responsibilities. So in there are some hyperlinks, um, for example, like Chromebook do's and don'ts, um, we we provided the we partnered with um, an insurance company where students and families can sign up for insurance for up to three hundred dollar coverage on the Chromebook. Um, Chromebooks are actually more than three hundred dollars, but we wanted to make it somewhat reasonable, so um, we will cover the difference. But if there's a crack or something happens to the Chromebook repairs, it's covered. And HHCEF, um, you know, recognizes that not everybody may not be able to afford that insurance, so that's why we're going to, going to be trying to help out with some nice quality cases. Kids will be required to bring their Chromebooks to and from school, 
So we want to make sure that when they're in the backpacks, that they're protected, that they're not tossed around, um, and, and that they stay safe. And so that's going to be part of the process, too, of you know learning how to take care of your Chromebook, how to bring it to it from school, how to make sure it's charged, things like that. Sounds like there's an amazing amount of work that's been going into this this summer. Um, does anybody have any questions? Me. Oh. Lori? <laughs> Sorry. I keep forgetting. Okay. I putting the wrong things down there. So um, we have done an extensive amount of teacher training, offered an extensive amount of teacher training over the summer. So in the spring, we um, when we had a captive audience with all of our staff, we did run uh, training sessions. We had, for example, a full day session, and then we had uh, virtual op opportunities of training run by either tech coaches or by BOCES or um, our a partner called Ask Otis. So a lot of teachers have been able to sign up for that. Um, when trainings come around, I've also been sharing that out with this summer. And the biggest thing is the tech coaches are preparing this work and reaching out to their colleagues. Um, you know, Margaret meets curriculumize with all, you know, with, the, with her teachers. And so we're kind of tag teaming with each other. And the tech coaches are getting feedback and creating these resources um, you know, we check in like, you know, about every week. They check in with their teachers, they reach out. We also have been meeting with um, APGA weekly to also kind of share updates and things that we're doing and get their feedback to help make some of these decisions. I'm going to pick up on how there been action. Go ahead, Margaret, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'll, I'll finish when you're finished. No, you finish first. Go ahead, maybe you're gonna answer I'm, my question. I'm gonna tag on to where Lisa, le oh, where Lisa, where Laura left off. So PD in the district over the summer, um, there have been a tremendous number of BOCES offerings, many of which I would, I'm happy to share were free. Free! <laughs> and we actually had a lot of TAs ask to attend, so that was very reassuring to see people signing up for things, um, curious about what's going on. It was really across a wide range of subject areas, and um, we approved many teachers to attend those one-day or sometimes two-day sessions. We are now at the part of our summer where we typically begin to bring in the consultants that we work with during the year to get the school year started. So we started this past uh, last week, this week, next week, very heavy duty with elementary grade levels. Uh, very important because to reduce class size, we've added sections, and so we've added teachers who have not taught that grade uh, maybe for a year or two or more. Um, and it's important for those teams to get together and help each other through the coming conversation. So our reading and writing consultants have been working with teachers, and that will continue through the beginning of the school year. At 6-12, we work with the same consultant across the two buildings. And uh, Anicia Bell Jefferson, who's the AP at the middle school, and Jim Mackin, myself, high school. consultants, yep, the high school, um, have been working with uh, a company called Meteor, who's been in the district for a while. All of this work is on pedagogy. So we know what we're teaching. We now have to figure out how does that teaching look in a virtual environment? And it is much more complicated to plan for a virtual environment as opposed to live instruction. So even though we have staff who will be teaching live, we've tried to shift their focus and think if the kid is listening to you or if you happen to have to go remote for one reason or another, that's what we should be planning for because it's easier to back it out and put it live in front of kids than it is to make that reverse happen. Getting people comfortable with that, you know, it, it's always a challenge, especially at the elementary level where although we use technology, we don't use technology that way, and certainly the spring was eye-opening for us. So, um, you know, those conversations, as I said, have begun, but it is summer, so I'm not going to lie and say we have a full complement of teachers. We have people who are around and available, and we knew that going in. Uh, so we're making the best of the situation. I'm talking to an awful lot of people. 
people who cannot make it for the day that the PD is being offered or you know they're calling me let me know how I can catch up uh, I can't be available to do this at that time we also unfortunately had people without power um, you know due to the recent storms that we've had so it, it is a fluid situation um, I've been working almost every day with the building principals to help them get ready to open to answer the questions they have and also to ask them to collaborate with me we have a great relationship so planning together has been very helpful and we've been looking at different scheduling options uh, the different ways that we're going to manage uh, on-site instruction together opportunities for outdoor classes as much as that is possible everybody keep your fingers crossed for a dry cool fall um, and that's really where we're at right now in my department it's grant time so we're getting all the title grants out the door and that means money and we got a little bit more money this year from the feds because they understand that we're expensing a little bit more than we normally do so we're grateful for the extra help in terms of title funding and lots and lots of coordination with Lisa and Laura. Our jobs overlap much more than I think the average person would recognize. So we, it's a good thing we like each other <laughs> because we talk literally seven o'clock in the morning we're texting and at eight o'clock at night we're chasing each other off the phone. So it's a delightful relationship and I think it's beneficial to our kids and our teachers that um, we work so well and mesh so well as we try to get this done. So we're looking forward to having kids back in the buildings and seeing our little babies and our big kids. Uh, it's always a lonely situation to be in an empty school, um, but we also know that we need them back safely and looking towards having a healthy environment for everybody. So I'll pass it off to Lisa. Wow, I, I'm not sure what else I can say. We, we are quite a team. Um, <laughs> And that's the one thing I think um, we really talk about um, a lot is, is meeting and what are the next steps and how can we go further. One thing that Margaret and I are collaborating on right now is executive functioning. So we are offering training for our staff and you know it's all remote, which is great. And we have staff members that are saying, sign me up, sign me up. One is a half day course for anybody that just wants to get an overview of executive functioning and what the strategies could be. Um, another day and then eventually we hope to do a, a live person um, in, in, in live person training for the actual curriculum. It's called the SMARTS curriculum. We used it in the, um, high school. The elementary started it last year, so we will be doing it in um, all three buildings next year, which is very good. Uh, we have done a lot of training with our psychologists and social workers uh, regarding DBT. Uh, it's going to the elementary next year which we thought was very apropos due to all the trauma that some of, the, of our students will have. Um, we are doing, we've done some psychological first aid training, uh, again, for school counselors, social workers, and psychologists. Um, we are going to open that up, hopefully, to all the um, staff members in the whole district. We're gonna hopefully work on that plan and eventually have a plan for parents to get some training from our, from our consultants at the CDC. Um, I have been fortunate enough to work with my special ed teachers. I can email them the night before and then jump on and, and they are really responsive and we're talking about planning and moving forward and really consulting with one another. Sometimes their ideas are a lot better than Margaret and Laura and I had together and we just say, oh, why didn't we think of that? Um, you know, as far as Lori was asking about the shields, um, we have purchased quite a few, especially for special ed, OTPT because we need to do small groups. Um, and those teachers really went through and said, I'd like this, 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 and this, and we really tried to order what we could. Um, it's not a cheap feat, but we will make sure that um, we get what students need, and if Anthony and I need to work together to order more, we can definitely do that. Um, we are actually doing live uh, re-evaluations and initial evaluations right now in the district office. So we have our barrier up, there's a slide through, um, Anthony has gotten us face shields, and masks, the students fill out in um, um, a questionnaire before they come. You know, have you, do you have a fever? Or have you been exposed? So we have that all digitally ready to go. Um, that has been very successful. Uh, and I thank Anthony and Kathy Brennan who really helped us set that up. Anthony has a room set up. There's one bathroom set up, um, hand sanitizer. Everything is right there in the room. So we have been very fortunate. It's kind of like our little test of what live will be like. Um, we have finished summer school on um, Friday. So Friday will be the end of our uh, remote educational summer program. 
Um, it has really um, been a trial and tribulation. Our kids cannot handle as much as we hope they could handle. There's only so much you can do with PT and OT and speech. There's a lot of games. There's a lot of um, interaction, but our kids need to be in school. And again, like Margaret said, we want it safe, but we do know that they need to enter school sooner than later. Um, I have two questions. Yep. Two question. It sounds like you guys have been doing a lot of training and collaboration. Um, you're collaborating with teachers. You're collaborating with the principals. When did this collaboration start? I think the day that I heard Joe say, come to district office. I remember I was homesick. And he goes, I need you to come in. I go, I'm sick. He's like, no, 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 I need you to come in. It was a Friday. And we went in, and as soon as that happened, that Monday, I had Google Meets with every department set up in my spot. So we had Google Meets every half hour because we had them for at least the morning, I think it was. So we started that day. We actually found out that we wouldn't be returning. Um, we knew it was two weeks at a time. So we, the three of us were constantly on the phone, but then we were setting up meetings with our teams um, immediately. I, I don't think we wasted. And I will tell you that if I go back and I think about those days, I said, I need a boundary because we were working 15 or 18 hours a day because you were home, your computer was there, and you knew stuff had to get done. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And um, it sounds like, you know, there's been a lot of collaboration. There's been a lot of training going on. It sounds like not all of the teachers have had the opportunity or the, not the opportunity, but the ability to participate as deeply as we would like them to this summer or that they might feel that they need to before school starts. So how realistically, how close do you think we are to getting ready to really having a good start on September 8th? Um, are we there yet or do we need more time? Because I hate to be stuck on a date. I want to open schools safely. I want to open schools effectively. What do you guys think? I mean, I, um, I think I know when we talk, we are a little concerned because there are some new um, platforms out there and we have offered training. As Laura said, some people will attend, and Margaret has said some people will attend. It's not, I get it, it's their summer vacation. If they can attend, they do, and they do get paid for attending. But um, I think we need some time for some more professional development because we want to do this, we want to do it right. Um, and I think all of us are in agreement that with these new um, platforms that we have um, and any kind of new scheduling, we want parents to be comfortable. I think that September 8th kind of is giving me a little a little um, anxiety, but you know, if we have to do it, we probably can pull it off, but will it be the best? I'm not gonna say yes. I, I wanna say also, one thing that we have to keep in mind is that it, it's more than just an issue of curriculum and instruction. It's also all of the new health and safety protocols that have to be internalized, the way we move through a building, how are we going to um, you know, help people, parents understand about drop-offs for those who are not riding the bus. There is a lot to the startup this year that doesn't normally exist. So we are aware of that, even though we, we always uh, have had the two days before kids come. Those two days fly by in a heartbeat in just an average school year, and there's so much more on our plate and so much more at stake this year that we want to be sure that we're prepared to the best of our ability and that we all feel good about welcoming kids coming through that door. Or, if I'm a teacher who's working with kids remotely, that I am confident in my ability to meet their needs in a virtual environment. So I would say that you know, if we had an opportunity to take a little bit of extra time once teachers are officially back in the district, it might be worth our while to think that through. And I would just echo that. I mean, I, I say this, I think, every time we talk about our, our teachers and technology and our pedagogy, we, ha we have been training and preparing for years. We, we are very ahead of our time compared to, I think, many districts because of a lot of the, the expectations we put on teachers in our district, especially our newer teachers as they come in. But that technology and that, that, that those trainings were all geared towards having a group of kids sitting in front of you in a classroom. Um, nobody has gone to school for virtual teaching. Nobody, you know, student teaching happens when you're in the physical classroom. Um, so this is a whole new, way of teaching, a whole new way of learning, 
Um, and then on top of that, you just add all of the restrictions just due to health and safety. Um, so it just adds another level that, you know, and our staff themselves. So we worry about, you know, students just just thinking about what it's going to be for students to get dropped off and picked up and how we're going to manage that. We also have to be thinking about how our staff are entering the buildings and leaving the buildings. And we have a lot of staff that are nervous and concerned about coming back to work and what that's going to look like, how that's going to feel. Um, so there's a lot of the, you know, with anything, you know, it's almost like we need a, a dress rehearsal or we need time to practice this um, because we have kids that we have to be responsible for. And it makes me nervous that um, we're going to put, put students in a bad situation. I also heard you talking about having classes outdoors put potentially, which is in complete contradiction to our safety plan that we just approved tonight. <laughs> a single point of entry we noticed that be outdoors. I did. <laughs> um, we do have so the, there are there are many things that are contradictory that is one of the things that teachers have mentioned to me the most in the past two or three weeks is that okay we have this fire code that says we have to have our doors closed and then we have the department of health code that says we have to have the doors open which is it and you know, that the, those are the kinds of situations that we have to be prepared to have an answer for and rationalize for ourselves as well as the community that we serve. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions about anything that's been covered or the start of school or any, anything, anything? We're very quiet out there. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, so. So I'm hearing we, we could be ready if we have to, but we're not really feeling 100% comfortable that we're ready yet. And um, I know I've had conversations with Joe that, that there are some area schools that are doing a phase-in type program. Have you guys discussed that at all? Joe, do you want to weigh in on that? A lot of districts are thinking of that and they're going to petition higher up people, right? Yeah, I heard Duchess is doing that. And yeah, we were, papers. we were, we um, were, we were asked to participate in basically. Joe. Oh. oh yes. Hello. Okay. We were. <laughs> okay. We were asked. Uh, we were asked to participate in a, peti a petition with the Westchester County Districts um, to ask the county executive to exert some sort of authority, some executive order, some sort of legal ability um, to keep schools in Westchester closed for a few more weeks if not into October. That schools would start remotely in September after requisite training took place, after staff felt comfortable. Uh, you know, the, the issue is this is not opening a normal school year. And um, we've been in the profession long enough that we've been able to do that with half our brain tied behind our back because our profession is very seasonal and we've been able to work out the kinks over years and decades so we've been able to uh, th there isn't too much that surprises us anymore and what this has done the pandemic and and the quick response and going digital back in march uh, it's forced uh, school districts to um, to be flexible quicker and what we're realizing is we could be flexible quicker if we're just talking about instructional practices, but we're talking about health and safety of students. We're minimizing the number of kids on a bus. We're reducing the number of students in the hallway, uh, in the restroom. It's uh, you know not eating in a cafeteria. This isn't, this isn't the school any of, us, any of us went to, and we're building it right now. Schools across New York State and the country are building these schools right now with a finite deadline of when we typically have always usually started school. So there are many discussions. Uh, many districts have made the decision to uh, start the school year virtually and bring students back in early, um, early October. That is a discussion in our county. It's a discussion in our neighboring state of Massachusetts and now recently New Jersey's governor is allowing schools to make that independent choice. And, and notwithstanding, and, and we should we should recognize this. The governor said schools can do this. 
the governor said that if you open schools with kids or open schools remotely, we're going to consider your schools open. So I believe we have to give it considerable thought. I will tell you that this team, our entire administrative team, uh, conversations with our employee unions uh, and other staff um, are asking me to recommend that to the board. They're asking me to have that discussion. So what would this look like? Would it be just all the students start on October whatever, or would some students come back earlier? Or I know I know that you guys have priorities as far as the earlier elementary kids, because you've talked about that before, the kids that are going through transitions to sixth and ninth grade. Um, special ed kids. I know that I know that there are kids that have priority. Would some of those come back early? Would everybody come back at the same time? Oh, I see you have a slide up here. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to share uh, I'm going to share our thoughts, and um, you know the thoughts have have been percolating among uh, many of us in the district, and and I'm going to say parents and teachers and our staff, our administrative staff, um, uh, and, and within the region. And the conversation is how do we safely do this and make sure kids still are academically connected. Um, a, a couple weeks ago, uh, Yonkers proposed that they open in a phased-in model, similar to how the governor opened the economy of New York State. Uh, as I mentioned, Massachusetts, uh, I even understand the Bronx and New York City now is, is trying to do this a little bit slower. Nobody wants to be uh, the district of the high school that's on CNN or NBC Nightly News uh, because kids got sick because no one was fully completely prepared. And as superintendent, I'm prepared to, to recommend that I would rather have students start remotely and delay in-person instruction to be over-prepared for a set of circumstances that public education has never faced before. And that's exactly uh, our situation. So I'll, I'll walk through this and, and share um, share our thinking, our collective thinking, um, that we know we have differing beliefs and viewpoints throughout our community about opening schools and uh, how that can be done safely and swiftly. We've heard from parents, we're going to hear from a few more a little bit later, about uh, their positions, uh, about making sure we do things um, thoroughly but safely but also that we don't rush the opening of school. Uh, we've created a model of, of student and parent choice. Never in public education has a parent been able to decide um, to send their kid to school or have a virtual experience um, within the public school setting. Uh, usually it was you send your, send your kids to school or you pay tuition for a different program or their home school. Um, public health professionals have, have been ringing the bell for a while about making sure um, making sure folks are, are ready, that districts are ready, and that systems are in place. I echoed a little bit earlier at our 4 o'clock uh, parent forum uh, that returning to school in September uh, should not be synonymous with the return to normalcy. Um, this is not a normal year. This is not a normal circumstance. We, we shouldn't pretend that it is uh, because it absolutely is not. Lori is a, a veteran math teacher in our region and, and uh, you know she could tell you about how upside down public education is right now for, for good reasons, for health and safety reasons, but it's a, a conundrum that the profession uh, hasn't, hasn't confronted. We still remain in a pandemic. We are in a medically legitimate pandemic right now. Uh, and opening schools in, in the middle of a, of a pandemic isn't necessarily uh, perhaps maybe the safest thing to do, but the governor also said that we could uh, start school with a remote model. And lastly, we have to redesign uh, the school experience. So. What we're talking about is the governor reopened the New York State um, economy in a very phased in approach. And what we're discussing is shouldn't Hendrick Hudson open their school doors in a similar phased in approach? So I'm going to share with you conceptually what other districts are contemplating, what other districts have already decided, and what we did is we put some dates, uh, some target dates, and some activities that could take place throughout the month of September. Uh, to gear up for an October 5th 
in-school program for our students. Phase one would be confidence and readiness. So from September 8th to the 11th, our staff return. As you've heard during the report out tonight, uh, we have 12 month staff who are here and we have 10 month staff that aren't. Uh, if we were to extend the school year uh, to mandate that staff returned early, uh, for all of our 10 month staff to return for one week of uh, additional work would cost the district $1 million. So we're, we're working now with some finite dates that we have. So this uh, proposal would be September 8 to 11, so the Tuesday after Labor Day. Staff would return. We would uh, have full staff in, in all of our buildings. Uh, we would have our safety training. And also, by the way, we have construction as well. So as you remember, the bond that was approved two and a half years ago is going to completely redesign the main entrances to our elementary schools. So uh, even if we didn't have uh, the pandemic and all of the health and safety standards that we now need to implement, just students' experience walking in and out of their school is going to be completely different. Uh, we have required CDC and DOH training. Um, that has begun uh, through our virtual uh, platform system, uh, but we also know not everyone's going to get it done before we, uh, before we make it in, on, in September. And also to implement school-specific protocols and system. Uh, kids are going to have a much different experience in school this year in terms of wearing a mask, taking mask breaks. We heard a uh, conversation about having instruction outside, uh, fewer kids on the bus eating lunch in, in their classroom and not the cafeteria. Uh, it is going to be a major paradigm shift and um, a major structural shift for 2,300 students to come back in September. School, the, 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 the building may be the same, but the experience may be unrecognizable and uh, taking some time to make sure that we can get it right and thorough and keep everyone safe and comfortable uh, is time well spent. Phase two would be connection and application. So on September 14th, that's a Monday, students would begin remote learning. We know uh, that we had some uh, hurdles to overcome last spring with our remote learning plan. Uh, you heard Laura and, and Margaret and Lisa talk about all of the staff development that's taken place. Uh, and the ongoing training that uh, we'll continue to have. So the week of September 14th, students would be at home. They would begin their remote learning. And again, this is after a, a, a four-day week of, of training and revisiting and revising our instructional plan with our staff that Laura talked about earlier. We would have social-emotional check-ins with students. This basically would be counselors, psychologists, social workers checking in with students to see how they're doing, to see how they're adjusting, see how their summer or spring was. Remember, we haven't seen kids since mid-March. Uh, it's going to be a, a really taxing and emotional experience when they do come back, and we have got to be ready for that. That's the social-emotional piece that Lisa and her team has been leading. We also need to train students on, on their own new protocols, their new uh, health and safety protocols. That likely could be done virtually during this first week of school, um, but to prepare them for a much different experience uh, when they walk through the doors. Lisa mentioned uh, training for families and parents, uh, a significant amount of training to make sure, uh, whether it's uh, special ed or, or students who are receiving certain services, I would say all students and all parents that they understand um, how school will be different and how we need to respond to it differently. And lastly, finalize our health screening protocol. Uh, we have been uh, asked by the CDC as part of returning to school to have a screening protocol. Every child uh, and family needs to attest that they're healthy, that they don't have symptoms, and that they don't have a fever. And um, we're looking at a, a, a web-based app, that uh, a mobile app that can go on your phone or iPad where parents could you know, check some boxes as kids leave the door and get on the bus. Um, that's going to take a significant amount of work uh, and training to make sure everyone's up to speed. Phase three would be acclimation and preparation. This is this is where we would phase in different students by program, uh, starting in any time between September 21st and October 2nd. So we would look to bring in kindergartners and first graders. Remember, kindergartners have not been in our elementary schools. They, they have not been anywhere. Um, 
so we want to make sure that we uh, have some time set aside for them uh, so they can get acclimated, meet their principal, meet their teacher in small groups, of course, learn the ropes and, and uh, where to go in the building. Special education, you heard Lisa. Um, we would bring back our special education programs, in particular our ABC program, our special class, some 12 one ones our middle school and high school special class 15-1-1 program. Uh, we would bring these students back uh, early so they can get reacclimated, um, so they can uh, receive their services quickly, especially their related services. And in speaking with the middle school and high school orientations, sixth graders are coming into the middle school for the first time and perhaps ninth graders into the high school for the first time. And that uh, they need to be uh, introdu introduced to their new learning environment in a very strategic and, and methodical way. So uh, both uh, John Owens at the middle school and Jim Mackin at the high school, um, they could use this time to think about bringing in kids in small groups, giving them tours, meeting their sixth and ninth grade teachers, uh, and, and doing the traditional activities of a school district uh, in a much different way. And that's, um, you know, that I, I hope that's not lost on anybody, that that the work that we do um, is is now sort of in question, and it's and it's in the air because we can't simply replicate that experience. And lastly, phase four, the execution. Uh, we would aim for the week of October fifth would be full in school schedule would be optimized for the families uh, that choose to send their children to school. That's when we would welcome our elementary kids, and that's when we would uh, implement and execute our hybrid learning model at the middle school and high school where students are in for two days and they're out for three uh, to make sure we follow uh, health and safety protocols as, as well as other CDC recommendations. This basically is um, sort of the foundational model of what, di of, of, of what a lot of districts are thinking about right now out loud and the model of why a lot of districts already made the decision. Um, I think the conversation is about um, being on time and hope that we're prepared for all of these facets or starting remote on September 14th and bringing children in on October 5th and being over prepared uh, because we've got one shot to get this right and there are many many moving parts the sand moves quickly under our feet um, and we're redesigning the school experience uh, for over 2300 children and and that's um, that's stressful and it's anxiety producing, but it's new. And uh, to do it in a short truncated period of time with the guidance that we've received and uh, some of the mandates that we have to follow given the enormity of the pandemic, um, I think if we phase in and if we move in this method, uh, we're gonna be better prepared and I think we'll serve our, our students and community much better. Well, that's uh, a much more thoroughly fleshed out plan than I was expecting. <laughs> so after our conversation the other day, thank you for that. Um, it sounds like if we decide, if we're going to decide to go this way, I know there are a lot of parents that have a lot of planning to do in the next few weeks, especially parents who um, are both having to go back to work or trying to juggle work at home schedules, things like that. So just the sooner we would decide on this, the better. When do you I guess the board should discuss this, how they feel about it, and then we should set a target date for when we would decide yay or nay on the um, phase-in program. Does anybody want to weigh in? Uh, I think it's a great plan, only because as a teacher, although I would love to participate in training, to tell you the truth, um, uh, you have to practice all of this stuff. So we can't go in the first day and just expect everything to run smoothly because we know it's not going to happen. So I, I think it's a really, really good plan. I, I, you know, I don't agree with every little thing about who comes in and stuff like that, but it's, I, I think it's an excellent plan. And, and we need time to practice with kids, to practice everything, to make sure that eventually we can get it right. Because I don't care what anybody says, it's not going to be right from day one. It's never, you know, you're asking school districts to perform a miracle within a very short amount of time. So um, I, I'm for this, to tell you the truth. I know how difficult it was to um, do protocols for a small business with way fewer people involved. Um, so 
I can appreciate the enormity of the situation. And there, and there was some, you know, there was some trial and error in the beginning. What works, what's efficient, what's not efficient, how's the traffic flow going to go, that kind of thing. And like, and we're working with children. It's like <laughs> exactly. And September is very hot, too. And trying to get children to do mask wearing when it's 90 degrees out and you have the windows open, they're immediately going to say these, these masks are really uncomfortable and I'm never going to wear one. So that's a, a little bit of a concern of mine also. Um, I, I did have one question, Joe. You said the kids wouldn't be in for the first four days. It would just be teachers doing training. Would that count against um, teaching days for the kids? Would they have to make that up on vacation days or something? Or, or that that counts as school being open? Are there aren't learning days for the children? Yeah, what, what we would do is we would look at our school calendar because remember, we... <laughs> We made this year's school calendar back in February, uh, so we've certainly learned a lot since. Uh, we have superintendents' conference days at different points of, of the school year that typically, um, you know, were for different activities in the school year, parent-teacher conference, or we had to, uh, you know, provide a space for, for an election, you name it. Um, so the philosophy here is that school districts have, have at least four superintendents' conference days for staff training. And what many of them, if they haven't done it already, uh, they're front-loading them. So uh, you don't lose state aid, you don't lose any, there's no financial penalty to the district uh, for doing this. They're considered instructional days for reporting to the state. Uh, and it's a way to create four full days of continuous uh, training and not have it broken up you know, through the, the four different seasons of the school year. If we use all those instructional days at the beginning, will we be in trouble later on in the year when we find that we need those types of days for other things as the situation changes and evolves? Yeah, so the, so the state has also made uh, provided districts with some leniency in terms of uh, seat hours, instructional hours versus instructional days. Uh, and they made some of that leniency available to us last year as well. Um, so we would be able to make that up if we needed it. We would be able to um, use some time at the end of the year for different reasons. Um, the reason that districts and, and, and we would you know, recommend front-loading the staff development days is if we don't have those four days of consecutive training, then there needs to be a direct academic experience for the kids at any time between the 8th of September and the 11th. And um, to have an un uninterrupted chunk of time to be able to meet a lot of these new and, and still evolving mandates, um, that would be a greater benefit than just having two days in a row and then trying to even go to virtual learning uh, on that Wednesday or Thursday. Thank you, Joe. Um, Lori went already. Mary Pat, do you have any questions or comments? No, I, 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 I had my own issues. Uh, we discussed them earlier. Uh, uh, at this point, I'm just, uh, no, I've got nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Allie? Um, yeah, I just, I know that many, if not most of our parents are eager to get their kids back in school, and that's obviously the priority for everyone, um, but I, I feel like this is, we only get one chance to do this right. There's only one chance to reopen the schools, and um, we, why not take the time to do it well, um, because if we don't, we're putting our, too many people at risk. Corey, did you have any questions, comments? No, I mean, my comments, we, we talked a lot about this over the past few weeks. Um, but, you know, my, my overall philosophy is it's better to do things right and take a little bit of extra time to get it done right rather than rush something out and, and have to redo it again later. Um, 
you know, there's always the possibility that we open schools up, we do everything right, and then something happens in the community and we got to shut schools down again. So, you know, we have a lot of different scenarios that can happen here. Um, and I want to give the district every chance to be successful. I know you've been, Joe and, and the team and everyone have been working on this a long time um, to get to this point. Uh, and we still have a lot more work to do now that we've got different guidance. So, um, you know, I would like to make sure that, that we involve the community, that people are given the chance to uh, give their input, and that the input is heard and taken seriously, um, and that we have specifics also. You know, we have a lot of very high-level guidance, um, but we need to get down to the specifics at the individual building level, which I'm starting to see, which I think has been great. I think, uh, you know, Mr. Mackin, since I've got kids in the high school, a uh, kid in the high school, uh, you know, seeing it as a parent, uh, you know, I've been really impressed with some of the communications he's put out. Um, and we just need to see more of that. Um, so that, that's where I stand. So I, I would like to see this, this phased approach um, go into effect. All right, well, it seemed fairly unanimous on this. Um, before you mentioned the community and, and I'm going to take this one step further in that I would certainly, I don't want to make this decision tonight, obviously, but I think we need a target date for when we're going to announce whether we're going to do a phase in or not. I would have liked to give at least a couple of days for the community to weigh in in case we're missing the 50% um, that say absolutely not, the kids should go back on September 8th and the phase in is ridiculous or something like that. Um, you know, so we're only seven members of the community. I'd like to hear from the wider community whether they think this is a good idea or not. It certainly sounds like it, and it certainly sounds sounds like all of us feel that this is a good idea. So, uh, Joe, did you have anything further? Uh, no, I think it's um, you know it's an opportunity to uh, look look back at. Uh, the entire enormous, enormous situation we're in at the 30,000 foot level. And uh, as Margaret said earlier, you, you move one piece of the puzzle uh, or the dominoes, it, they, fell, they fall elsewhere. So um, I think the, the staff in this organization um, are working as hard as possible to try to prepare an experience that we've never had. And, and that has created a lot of stress and frustration and anxiety. Um, and, and the reality is we don't have all the answers. We don't have the granular details because we're still, um, we're still trying to you know, figure out what's accessible or doable or what's even possible. And um, understanding that parents are frustrated, I mean, the, the folks who are trying to put this together are, Ten times as frustrated, and um, you know it's what Lori said as as a teacher. You know whether you know she's in in the loop or not. This is um, this is a statewide conversation. I mean we're we're in a part of the state where we border other states. It's it's happening all around us, and um, you know a lot of districts are are trying to hit the pause button um, because we're working really really hard and still not able to necessarily dig out because of um, of how new and how different that this is. It's it's um, a watershed moment in the public education field for sure. Um, so obviously we need to let people know we're thinking about doing this and then have time for some feedback. Do we have a target date for when you think that the district would be ready to make this decision to go ahead with the phase and plan or not? I think, um, you know, in, in terms of the folks who are responsible for executing and putting the plan together uh, and speaking with the unions, and Laura mentioned we spoke with HHEA and uh, Enrique spoke with custodians and secretaries, um, I think the sooner the better because that would relieve such a pressure valve. It would, it would be... Um, such a blessing to be able to have the extra time or just take a breath. Um, you know, if, if you want to let it sit and simmer and we make a decision next Wednesday or Monday, um, you know, in terms well, I of... Thinking, I was thinking Friday. Well, 
or Friday. I, I mean, uh, you, you know, the bold the, the the bold part of me says says we need to you know <laughs> we, we need to do it so we can so people can plan and understand and um, you know in terms of feedback, we've got a parent forum tomorrow. I think this will be the topic, but you know, without it being a a very structured or methodical survey, you know, we're going to hear uh, from, or by way of emails, phone calls, and social media. So uh, this is, districts are doing this. I guess I would say that. Districts are moving in this direction. The county is having this countywide discussion. The state of Massachusetts um, uh, uh, began school planning in this method. Um, there's a trend here, and I think it's, it's growing it w with momentum. Um, so I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure how, how much, you know, how much feedback is enough to, you know, to say we're going to do it. I, I know we're in a tricky spot, um, but we're also at a point, you know, of, of we need to make a bold decision shortly. Uh, so, Enrique wants to weigh in a little bit. Also, I want to remind everyone, I want to remind everyone that most of our custodians, trauma teachers, are on vacation. They go on vacation, if they go to a state where they have to come back and they have to quarantine, we might be ready to open in September 6th, but we don't have the people. I mean, this is a real concern that we might not have the people because they have to quarantine. And I cannot tell anyone where to go on vacation. They go wherever they want. And if they went to any of those states that are increasing by the day, they have to quarantine for two weeks. And we might be ready, but then we don't have enough uh, bus drivers to bring the kids to school. So there is a lot more than just preparing is to be sure that we have the staff when we open school. So it sounds like you're in favor of a phase in as well. Definitely. Definitely. And again, it would be great the sooner the better because then we can plan, we can tell students, we can tell the family. So the families, the students, everyone can start planning. Okay, we're, uh, if they need uh, uh, childcare or anything, it's not a week in advance. We're giving them a month. So uh, I think it would be great if, like you said, Carol, if this Friday you can make, we can all make a decision um, Joe can announce it to the community and people start planning and we can start planning. Okay. Allie, did you want to say something? Uh, I was just wondering if there was going to be an official correspondence um, from the district to all parents about this um, or is it just part of the board document, like the minutes? Uh, how will parents learn about this is a big shift from anything that we've been talking about so how do we get the word out and um, solicit feedback? We'd certainly put a communication together tomorrow morning uh, about how we arrived where we are, uh, the rationale to it. Um, we won't. Uh, we don't. We don't need to look too hard to, um, you know, justify the thinking. I mean, we have many districts around us, and as I said, every district in Westchester is. Uh, we're actually part of a phone call with the county executive on Friday uh, to discuss this. Um, so we would put out a, a communication, uh, direct email to parents, something on the website um, tomorrow, and you know let them know our thinking. Uh, you know it, it certainly is a shock. I'm sure it was a shock when Monroe Woodbury and and other districts said we've got to start remote because there's just too much at risk. There's too much to lose, and and um, we need more time on our side. So you know, look, it, it, it's. There are going to be families that want their kids in school, and I get it. And there are going to, and there are families who, you know, I'm reading their emails or their questions for forums saying, please, please don't do it. Uh, we already have. Uh, I won't try to look it up. I don't want to screw this up. We already have about 150 parents um, in in a day and a half that are seeking a full-time remote option, 
you know I think I think the needle is moving um, the issue is we've got to we've got to make a decision for for all the kids Okay. Oh, Lisa, sorry. What, Lisa? I was just wondering, um, will that decision be made in a public forum, like with a vote, or what is the appropriate way of doing that? The board does not have to vote on this. The, the administration gets to decide when and how we're opening school. The, um, to the technical sense, Lisa, the act that the board would take eventually at some point would be um, adjusting the school calendar. Uh, that's that's something we would have to do and um, you know if the board wants to pass a resolution to do it the, the board can do that I think um, you know if, if if I could get into the thinking of how these plans were developed by the state and, and Department of Health it's it's very interesting that the Board of Education was not was was not part of approving any of those plans and my guess is is that those agencies knew districts had to go quick and you know move quickly and put plans in place and may not have been able uh, that the timeline may not have you know permitted the you know the full vetting with you know different agencies or or throughout the community that that's just my guess um, but Allie's right this this would be a major shift in thinking um, but we would not be alone. Uh, and the rationale is out there. It's sound, and you know other communities. Um, it's it's a, a discussion that they're having, or you know a decision that was made because of the enormity of the situation. Association town called the end of July and we were discussing on that the options that schools in our area were considering in, in reopening and creating reopening plans. I did hear at that meeting quite a few schools talking about doing the four days worth of conference um, days, superintendent conference days that was already being discussed in other districts back at the end of July. Um, you know, most, it seems like most schools are planning on doing the hybrid version for middle school and high school. Um, there are some elementary schools like ours that are considering doing a four to five day per week for the elementary school kids. Um, with the hybrid plan, there is usually a day that is remote for all, like we're discussing too in our district. Many districts reported that they are considering changing the school calendar to allow for these superintendent conference days at the beginning of the year, like we just discussed tonight. Um, 
Other considerations that we discussed were things such as bandwidth, increasing that um, time needed to deep clean, mental health, transportation. It's, it's all similar things to what we were discussing this evening as well. Um, but the, the big takeaway from that is we are not alone in our struggles to figure these things out. And there are many other districts, all the other districts in our surrounding area are definitely struggling and trying to figure this all out together. Um, the other meeting I attended was um, as the advocacy liaison with the New York State School Boards Association. We had a meeting on the 29th of July with Senator Chuck Schumer. And we had about 30 minutes of his time and we were able to present our concerns and request his help. His priorities for the next round of stimulus funding are state and local funding, education funding, and something called the Coronavirus Child Care and Education Relief Act, abbreviated CICERA. Um, he encouraged us to ask our parents to reach out to our congressional representatives to request that they get the job done and get some funding for our school districts. Um, the other thing that I wanted to report on is that NISPA, which is again the New York State School Board Association, has requested that we take action and write letters to our federal legislators to let them know their assistance is vital for our schools to adequately meet the academic, social, emotional, and physical needs of our students, whether they're meeting remotely or in person, and you know now that we are so close to the upcoming school year beginning. Um, they have a letter that they've created that's called Support Additional Funding in States for K-12 through Public Education. Um, it's one of those sample forms that you can click and fill in. Um, I, I wanted to just discuss and see how people felt about our district participating in that um, and you know, possibly doing some slight additions, subtractions to it. I can send along to each of the Board of Ed members the, the draft of what their letter looks like and then we could discuss what changes we'd like to make to it if that sounds like a good way to move forward. And that's that's pretty much all of it. <laughs> the link for our federal representatives, by the way, to, to Senator Schumer, Senator Gillibrand, and to Neil Lowy, our congressional representative. Thank you so much. I'm so happy that you uh, had the time and opportunity to participate in these things. I think it's really important for our district to be represented. Um, I kind of jumped ahead. I got so excited about the um, phase-in delay plan and that discussion that I completely missed that Laura and I were supposed to give us an update on the Employee Leave Act. Um, so we will also I'm going to circle back there before we get to audience comments. Sorry, Laura. No problem. Um, uh, uh, Enrique had kind of mentioned it a little bit. Um, so Enrique and I manage the human resources for the school district and one of the things that we are um are trying you know trying to get a better handle of and support all of our staff with understanding as well is um are the rights they have with the family first coronavirus response act which is ffcra um so there's lots of different kind of caveats to that and we there is a link on our website um, under our personnel and we have shared this with um we got to get this with HHEA, we shared it with staff. Um, so basically, and I, I could go into a lot of details, but I'll just kind of give you the overview. Um, if I am a parent and I have school-aged children that are under the age of 14, and my child's school is closed due to COVID-related reasons, um, I could apply for um, FMLEA, very similar to FMLA. So I could take up to 12 weeks of leave. Um, that leave is paid two-thirds of my daily rate, up to $200 a day. Um, and what just came down with a court ruling this week is that the, uh, in New York State, they haven't, the Department of Labor hasn't changed the language on it yet, and we don't know if it's going to be, be appealed, but that um, if I was a staff member and I wanted to take this leave, I could take it intermittent. So if my child, for example, I can give you my, my children are on a hybrid schedule. Um, so they go to school two to three days a week. On the days that they are home, I could request to take those days as part of um, FMLEA. There's also um, language in there around um, quarantining, as Enrique mentioned. So if I am quarantined, taking care of someone who's quarantined, have symptoms that cause me to self-quarantine, 
Um, there is a two-week leave that's built into that as well that people can take. Um, and this can happen at any time. And, if, and right now, this goes through December 31st. We don't know if the, the government, this is a federal law, is going to extend this or not. Um, but it may. So right now, we are dealing with staff who, who this is a viable option for them because they don't know what to do with their children at home. Um, or, um, you know, that, that's a big issue. We also have um, staff who might just have uh, disabilities and under the uh, American Disabilities Act might have rights to accommodations that we would have to even see if they're reasonable accommodations that we are able to provide for them. Um, so again, these are um, serious conversations that are happening that Enrique and I are trying to manage and, and support our staff the best we can and provide them with the knowledge. Um, but it could result in us not having all the staff that we, we rely on. Well, it's, it's a concern. Um, as reported earlier, uh, our team has been meeting with uh, HHEA, the Teachers Association, and the reason we mentioned them uh, is they're the largest group, almost 250 teachers, and in the governor's comments last week, you know, he said, you have, you've got to talk to your teachers to make sure they're going to come to work. If they're not coming to work, you don't have schools. Um, and that's a real concern. It's a real concern that um, we would make a phone call at 6 in the morning and turn buses around because we can't adequately staff our schools in a safe, reliable, and, and healthy way. So this is, you know, another wrinkle, one of those, um, you know, maybe unintended consequences of what the law, you know, was trying to, to do or help or support, um, <clears throat> but leaves the grim reality that we could be understaffed for a significant part of the school year. And, uh, you know, Laura, uh, as is Rike is, but Laura's the one fielding the calls and, and the letters and emails with teachers who are um, considering not returning because of, of uh, very specific issues related to, um, related to COVID and the pandemic and, and many other different anxieties going on. I just have a quick question that, that's on a different topic, so I don't know if you want to address it now. Uh, I think you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, Joe, you know, in, in light of the guidance to have interactive sessions with the parents, I know you started the forums today. Could you just give an update um, on how it went and, and how the interaction was with the parents? Sure. So uh, on Friday, the governor announced um, that schools need to um, create, uh, actually have, uh, I'll read it to you. Schools must have three public meetings prior to August 21st with parents who will be allowed to participate remotely and one meeting with the teachers to go over their reopening plan. So we sent out a call for questions um, on the various topics of our reopening plan. And we received 137 questions, uh, and we shut that down at 10 o'clock this morning. That's why we, we wanted to have a, um, an end time so we could actually build the conversation to answer the questions. So we put a, a pretty detailed and thorough PowerPoint slide together on those eight topics uh, based on the 137 questions. Many of, some of them uh, were already answered through the remote learning option or some other areas. Uh, some of some of the answers to the questions are already on our FAQ, uh, but we looked at uh, the big themes within those questions, and then we developed a presentation around it. And the idea was not to lecture at anyone. The idea was uh, to answer their questions through a presentation, um, and, as there were many themes. So we had at one point 213 viewers was our max. 
We ranged anywhere between 200 and 205 throughout the about 75 minute presentation. Uh, it will be archived, it will be put on our website um, uh, for people to, to watch a little bit later. Um, and we, we put the presentation together, again, based on themes. Um, not necessarily the, the one-off question that um, I could respond to or I sent one to Margaret to respond to. Um, you know, I, I think the intention is, is to, you know, give an update at, uh, at sort of the big picture level, um, move our process along, and, and a lot of the questions, is, as I think Carol mentioned, you know, we'll get discussed when, when the schools put their action plan together to, to open the doors. Um, you know, a, a, a true Q&A, um, we, we could do that. Um, it will be a lot of people watching, you know, watching the district answer someone else's question. Um, so we were looking at how do, we, how do we use everyone's time effectively and how do we speak to the majority of the themes or the questions that were coming in. So thanks, Joey. I appreciate that a lot. Um, do you think that the parents were happy with this format, or do you think that there are parents who might still have questions or maybe had different expectations? Well, I can't answer the expectation question. Um, you know, again, it's sort of like I didn't. We don't know how to keep score. Um, I received an email saying it would be great if you could do this next time. And I've received emails and text messages saying it was thorough, it was detailed, it was professional. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's an endless battle of how everyone believes they need to be heard, how everyone gets their questions answered, and, and to what, de what degree of thoroughness that they are answered. Um, you know, like I said, there are different camps out there. There are different beliefs of what reopening school looks like and um, what the what the process should be. So, uh, you know, I could I could share feedback all across the spectrum because I've already received it. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. Um, I have a quick question. So, your the presentation tomorrow and then the one on Monday will cover the theme 137 questions, and then anything else that comes in between, I guess, now and 10 o'clock tomorrow. Is that yeah, yeah. So, so we divided up the, you know, as the questions come in, they get fed through basically uh, an Excel spreadsheet and they're time stamped so we can see when they came in. And then we can see by theme, that's why we asked them to identify the theme that they'd like to talk about, any of the eight themes. So then we could see in real time what percentage of questions relate to what topic and then pull those questions out by topic to see, okay, what, what are the themes in these questions so we can build a conversation around it. So uh, again, that started at 10 o'clock today and we turned it around by four, but had to make sure that Lisa and Margaret and Laura looked at the data, looked at the questions coming in. Certainly we had, uh, they were present as well as Liz and Anthony uh, and Enrique to talk about uh, you know different um, divisions of the district that they lead. So, you know, I'd say in less than six hours, we turned 137 questions around and tried to um, tried to get to the majority of them by, by topic and content. Um, since that presentation ended around 5.30, uh, I was looking at the new set of questions that were coming in, so we, we already had maybe a handful by then. Uh, and some of them are very specific, you know, that it's an easy email answer back. Um, the, big, the big themes, uh, either they're already on our FAQ or we'll take uh, we'll take some of the, the questions that we answered tonight and we'll add them to our FAQ. So the idea tomorrow is to see if, see if there are a need for follow-up or um, if there are different questions coming, you know, coming out of tonight's meeting, which I assume that there will be uh, in terms of interest and, and looking for uh, additional information. But we, we try to make it as real-time as possible and try to coordinate it as well. Committee reports. Um, our next section is audience comments. 
Carmen. I know we have a couple of them at least. I don't know if we have more than I can forward it to you as well. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We have it's Carmen Koch, district clerk. Um, I have we have three statements we're going to read tonight that came in. Um, the first statement is was dated August 11th from Rhonda Malhotra. We learned so I'm going to read the statement that she would like for us to read. We learned yesterday that the state has included us on their list of school districts that have not submitted any learning plans to the state for review. Mr. Hoffreiter has chosen to rebuke that statement and the state refuses to accept his rebuttal. So I am respectfully looking for answers as to what is going on in our school district. We are hearing that our building principals do not have answers to many of the questions that their parents and students are posing and that they are waiting on the superintendent to guide them and act to make a decision regarding going back to school. We have heard directly from our teachers that they, they have, have been ignored in this process and have received no mandatory training this summer for either health and safety or the learning plans. We know that parents and upper grade students are extremely frustrated, upset, bewildered by all the, these things. The lack of forethought coupled with time constraints we currently find ourselves under is less than desirable. It leads us to a reactive situation as opposed to being proactive to come up with solutions to educating and keep safe the almost 2,000 students in this school district. As my elected officials, I demand answers to these allegations and hope that you will follow up directly with the parties involved. I also request an investigation into our superintendent and his means and methods. I have lost any faith in his abilities to handle this situation and respectfully ask that you support our community going forward by being the watchdog that your positions ask you to be. Respectfully, Rhonda Maholtra. questions were addressed this evening. If there were any that were not addressed this evening, I would ask that you get in contact with either myself or Mr. Hawkwriter and we'll follow up with you on those additional concerns. So the next statement I'm going to read is on, uh, was sent in on the behalf from Rebecca Quigley on the behalf of the concerned parents of Hendrick Hudson. So she wrote, I am submitting this cover letter and petition on behalf of concerned parents of Hendrick Hudson to the Hendrick Hudson Board of Education for inclusion in tonight's meeting. As per my discussion with Carol on August 11th, we removed the names of the Hendrick Hudson stakeholders who have signed it. I respectfully ask that these documents be included in the minutes. Please let me know if, if you are required to any additional information from me in order for this to occur. Thank you for your time and assistance in this matter. We are going to enter the petition into the record to, uh, in the minutes. The third item, oh, so Carol, do you want to say something? Yeah, thank you. So, yes, um, Rebecca and I had been in contact about this petition, and there was an email and also a verbal exchange back and forth. So I think all of those are the, well, definitely the petition is going to be entered into the minutes, and then we have been in contact with them as well. Okay. The third statement we're going to read was dated, it came in on August 7th from Erica Mills. So I'm going to read her statement. Good evening. I wanted to touch base with you about our reopening plan and my disappointment in the process as well as the concerns I have about being prepared to safely return to school. My experience with distance learning in the spring was all over the place. I have a student at BMS and another at the high school. There was little consistency and minimum face-to-face -face instruction or contact. For the fall, I was hoping we would return to school in some capacity so the kids could experience some in-person instruction and socialization. Even if it was going to look much different, I trusted that Hen Hud's administration would be on top of ensuring we had a well-thought-out plan for all possible scenarios. It is now clear to me that we do not have this in place. I have spoken to many parents and other stakeholders, and at this point it is my understanding that we are far from ready to go back in just four short weeks. This is my understanding. Some of this could have been addressed in the past week. We don't have PP in hand, PPE in hand. We don't have polycarbonate dividers ordered. 
We don't have cleaning products in stock. Our teachers have received no professional development to learn the technology needed to provide online instruction. We don't have necessary upgrades needed through buildings, throughout buildings, such as paper towel dispensers instead of hand blowers. Teachers don't have guidance on how they will deliver content from classrooms or elsewhere. These are just a few concerns that, I leave, that leave me wondering why. Why do our neighboring districts seem to have answers? If you look at the plans laid out by Croton, Somers, Ossing, Yorktown, etc., they are much more detailed and their task force, including many participants, not just seven. I have heard hop writers say that seven people assigned to the task force have included and spoken to other school staff, but I still see little no evidence that this actually happened. Have you spoken to principals in the buildings to see when they were brought into this very important process? Why weren't parents included? Why weren't students included? Why aren't teachers and principals on the task force? I have so many questions about this process and it leads me to su suspect that Hen Hut won't be ready for s to safely open in September. The frustration and worry I feel about re-entry to school keeps me up at night because there are too, way too many questions that have not been answered. We need the Board of Education to hold the administration accountable. Waiting on, the gover waiting on Governor Cuomo has proven to be fruitless. His announcements this past week have not given clear guidance. I am not sure why we would be waiting for the state to do the right thing and, and provide clear expectations and direction. In the past, they have not proven that they have prioritized schools, students, or staff, especially in Hen at Hen Hut. While these are unprecedented times and no one could have, been, have expected this situation, we have to strive to do better. We need clear leadership. We need everyone included in the process. We need to ask very hard questions. If our district admins lack the experience necessary, why not expand to utilize all the experts we have? There are countless educators on staff and parents with expertise that can help guide us through the process successfully not to mention the students who actually participate in the learning process. They may, th they may think of solutions that others m do not. We have strength in numbers. We had so much time to do this right, we had so much time to do this right, and now we will be scrambling to figure out the details. I truly hope going forward we can correct the errors of the past and come together to make the return to school and process work for as many people as possible. And for one, I am not confident that my chi children and their teachers will be safe or have the tools necessary for a productive 2020-21 school year at this time. I went from hoping to be back in school to not being com confident we are ready and hope hoping for a full online option to accommodate my kids safely from home. All stakeholders need to be involved in this process starting now. I implore the Board of Education to be active going forward and to please commit to making sure people are comfortable and confident and have choices that make everyone feel safe upon our return to school. We the community have chosen each of you to be our voice and hear and react to our needs. This is the call to immediate action on the behalf of the community that has elected you. The children of Hendrick Hudson deserve better than they have received. Thank you, Erica Mills. This statement will go into record. Thank you, Erica, for that input as well. Um, I hope that our administration, through our parent forms and the input we received tonight, can help us restore your faith and the reopening of our schools, as you may have heard. Um, we also feel like maybe we need a little bit more time to be absolutely extra over prepared to have students in the building. Um, the specific questions you have are very appropriate for the parent forms and for the FAQ, so we'll please submit those. And um, Eric and I actually have been in contact about this statement already since she had submitted it last week for the meeting, and I didn't want her to have to wait a whole week to get a reply from someone in, on the board. So thank you very much. And are there any other comments for the audience comments. No, no other ones at this time. Alright, that's it. So, that brings us to our board comments and new business, and I actually have something for board comments and new business, and I would kind of like to talk about our meeting formats a bit. Um, you know, this was sort of a temporary situation back in end of March, early April when we closed. 
Um, and now it looks like it's going to be a more long-term situation. Yeah. Getting back into the buildings for meetings, although may make good sense from an optics point of view, probably does not make good sense from a health and safety point of view. Having extra people in the building that don't absolutely need to be there, inviting the public into a building, which would have to be limited because of size of uh, restrictions from the governor, also probably would not be what I would advise, having a lot of you know people in a school building that you don't absolutely have to have there. Having said that, um, having a bunch of people talking on a screen isn't good either. So I would very much much like to get our faces in view along with our presentations if that is at all possible, which I'm sure it is. Hopefully, maybe Laura, if you can help out if the, if the new Google um, meeting software could help us out. I know you were talking about breakout rooms and things like that earlier. Um, I think we could do better with our meeting formats. Anybody else want to make comments about that? I'll just make a quick comment is that I just sent instructions on how to do it, so hopefully we can do it for next time. <clears throat> Excellent. Yes, we can make it happen. It's a connection with the live stream. The new Google, the Google Meet enhancements are not yet in place. Um, I know this is really much easier with districts that are using Zoom and paying for those licenses, but um, we absolutely can work with Greg and our, our staff to make it happen. That would be fabulous. I, I think it would also be very important for us to be able to be on in person, so that we, I mean, not in person, but on camera so that people can, can see us and, you know, it just, it, it's hard, I'm sure, to stare at that screen with just hearing talking heads, um, talking voices. So I, I, would, I would also really like to see this happen. Thank you. And my fellow board members know because I, I've said on a number of occasions, I would love it if we could go back to having in-person meetings. It's so much easier to moderate the meetings. It's easier to have discussions. This is a little um, stilted for me. I find it hard to talk through the microphones. Um, but again, I just from a health and safety standpoint, and because people have different um, health needs, shall we say. I don't know that we could get everybody into the same building at, at this point. So making our virtual meetings more user friendly is a top goal for me. Um, so let's see if we can get that happening. Anybody else want to comment on my meeting format? Anybody have objections to being on camera? I suppose you could still call in actually and just have a, uh, a icon there. So we can discuss that further at a later date as well. All right, anybody else have any new business or comments they'd like to make before we end the meeting? Okay, can I get a motion to close the meeting, please? Lori, so moved. Corey, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, have a good evening, everybody. Uh -huh. Our next scheduled public meeting, I believe, is August 26th. Let me just double check my yes. calendar.